Often before now have I applied my thoughts to the puzzling question, one probably which will puzzle me forever. Why it is it that while all Greece lies under the same sky and all the Greeks are educated alike, it has befallen us to have characters so variously constituted? For a long time, Polly, Kles, I have been a student of human nature. I have lived 90 years and nine. I have associated too with many and diverse natures and having observed side by side with great closeness, both the good and the worthless among men, I conceived that I ought to write a book about the practices in life of either sort. I would describe to you class by class the several kinds of conduct which characterize them and the mode in which they administer their affairs, for I conceive <coughs> you have to edit that. Polyclus, that our sons would be the better if such memorials are bequeathed to them, using which as examples they shall choose to live and consort with men of the fairest lives, in order that they may not fall short of them. And now I will turn to my narrative, be it your part to come along with it and to see if I speak rightly. In the first place, then I will commence my account with those who have studied irony, dispensing with preface or many words about the matter. I will begin with irony and define it. Next, I will set forth, in like manner, the nature of the ironical man and of the character into which he has drifted. And then I will try, as I proposed, to make the other affections of the mind plain, each after its kind. You just recorded this part. <laughs> I don't care. The ironical man. Irony, roughly defined, would seem to be an affectation of the worst in word or deed. The ironical man is one who goes up to his enemies and volunteers to chat with them. Instead of showing hatred, he will praise to their faces those whom he attacked behind their backs and will sympathize with them in their defeats. He will show forgiveness to his revilers and excuse things said against him, and he will talk blandly to persons who are smarting and do wrong. When people wish to see him in a hurry, he will desire them to call again. He will never confess to anything that he is doing, but will always just say that he is thinking about it. He will pretend that he was just he has just arrived, that he was too late or that he was unwell. To applicants for a loan or subscription, he will say that he has no money. When he has anything for sale, he will deny that he means to sell. For when he does not mean to sell, he'll pretend that he does. Hearing, he will not will affect not to have heard, seeing not to have seen. If he has made an omission, he will say that he does not remember it. Sometimes he has been considering the question. Sometimes he does not know. Sometimes he's surprised. Sometimes it is the very conclusion at which he once arrived himself. And in general, he is very apt to use this kind of phrase. I do not believe it, I do not understand it, I am astonished, or he will say that he has heard it from someone else. This, however, was not the story that he told me. The thing surprises me, don't tell me. I do not know how I am to believe, disbelieve you, or to condemn him. Take care that you are not too credulous. Such the speeches, such as the doublings and retractions to which the ironical man will resort. Disingenuous and designing characters are in truth to be shunned more carefully than vipers. To flatterer, flattery may be considered as a mode of companionship, degrading but profitable to him who flatters. The flatterer is a person who will say as he walks with another, do you observe how people are looking at you? This happens to no man in Athens but you. A compliment was paid to you yesterday at the Stoa. More than 30 persons were sitting there. The question was started. Who is our foremost man? Everyone mentioned you first and ended by coming back to your name. With these and the like words, he will move a morsel of wool from his patron's coat. Or, if a speck of chaff has been laid on the other's hair by the wind, he will pick it, up, pick it off adding with a laugh. Do you see? 
because I have not met you for two days. You have had your beard full of white hairs, although no one has darker hair for his ears than you. Then he will request the company to be silent while the great man is speaking, and will praise him too in his hearing, and mark his approbation at a pause of true, or he will laugh at his at a frigid joke and stuff his cloak into his mouth as he could not repress his amusement. He will request those whom he meets to stand still until his honor has passed. He will buy apples and pears and bring them in and give them to the children in the father's presence, adding with kisses, chicks of a good father. Also, when assists at a purchase of slippers, he will declare that the foot is more shapely than the shoe. If his patron is approaching a friend, he will run forward and say he is coming to you, and then turning back, I have announced you. He is just the person, too, who can run errands to the women's market without drawing breath. He is the first of the guests to praise the wine and to say as he reclines next to host, how delicate is your fare, and taking up something from the table. Now this, how excellent it is. He will ask his friend if he is cold, and if he would like something more. And before the words are spoken, we'll wrap him up. Moreover, he will lean towards his ear and whisper with him, or up. Moreover, he will lean, or will glance at him as he talks to the rest of the company. He will take the cushions from the slave in the theater and spread them on the seat with his own hands. He will say that his patron's house is well built, and that his land is well planted, and that his portrait is like... In short, the flatterer may be observed saying doing, and doing all the things by which he conceives that he will gain favor.